I could not believe the anger, the hostility to what seemed like such a normal and right world um, that I was determined, welcome or not, I was going back. And I didn't care if anybody liked me or didn't like me, I was coming back. Barbara Henry didn't set out to be a civil rights crusader in 1960 when she agreed to be a teacher at the newly desegregated William France Elementary School in New Orleans, Louisiana. All the other teachers refused to lead any classes where white and black students learned together. Henry was different. I became a teacher, I think, because of my fantastic education at Boston Girls Latin School, where uh, there was developed such a respect for learning and uh, education per se, that I early on could not have imagined a life uh, being lived anywhere but in the world of academia. But it was really the respect um, given by the faculty to all the students, irrespective of their class, community, or color, which allowed, I think, us all to appreciate one another, our diversity, irrespective of how it was dressed. It could not have been a richer, more rewarding environment to have grown up into. That, that has been the guiding force and the inspiration for all that I have done. After graduating college and teaching elementary school for a few years, Henry accepted a job with the United States military in Paris, France, where she would teach the children of military families. She met her future husband on base. The couple returned to the United States to be close to his family in New Orleans, and Henry applied for a teaching job in her new city, a job she did not know would impact United States history. I received a call from the superintendent's office uh, following my um, interview there and asking me if I would like to take a first grade position and I was thrilled. I was so eager to get back to teaching and um, knowing desegregation was to take place, I asked him was this one of the schools to be desegregated to which he replied yes and would it make a difference to me and I was quite befuddled by that uh, question of course <laughs> applying immediately. Uh, absolutely uh, not. In the early days, I couldn't understand why I would be asked that question. But later, I came to realize that that superintendent of schools was under a court order, that he had to have a teacher uh, for the person or persons who were to be um, black children who would enter that school. And the teacher in the school to which I was being uh, sent refused to teach a black child, and so she left the school. And I was interested in teaching children no matter where they came from or whatever color their skin was. I had no idea uh, who would be in that class. I just assumed it was a first grade class in a desegregated school. Henry was ready for the new challenge, but she was not ready for the scene in front of her school on the first day. My husband followed me in his car, and when we saw the enormous crowd fronting the school, it was quite stunning, totally unexpected. and. Um, so he got out of his car and he said, oh, what do you think? And I think it was a rhetorical question. I think he knew my answer. You know, during those six years at Latin school, there reigned high up on this double-decker blackboard for six years in our Latin school uh, classroom, the moral ethic, duty first, honor always, self lost. I, there was no chance. I had given my word to the superintendent. I would be there. And I truly think it was that chalk white beacon of long ago that led me through that raging sea of angry protesters to make my way to the front door of the school that day. It was, it was essential that I be there and um, however I got there. It was, it was frightening, but perhaps one feeling of security was no one knew who I was and I was the same color as the protesters, so they had no idea of my snaking my way through the crowd to the barricades at the front. I walked to the front door by myself, unaccompanied with the raging crowd behind me, rang the doorbell, and um, there was a, gla a glass entry with iron bars on, uh, uh, as part of the door frame, and I sort of charaded my introduction. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Henry. And uh, the man left the door. And I thought, oh, so what do I do? I ring the doorbell again. And the same thing happened. The man came down and I tried to make him understand who I was. And he left. And I then I really 
pretty much panicked and I thought, what am I going to do? I had no one with me to help me out at all, to know what to do. Um, and I thought, well, there's no choice but to pursue this and be persistent. So I rang the doorbell the third time and the door opened and he said, I'm sorry, we thought you were a reporter. Freed from the wild and noisy mob and the anger outside, I entered that building, which uh, was distinctive and different only in the fact that it was quiet and really quite silent. Someone showed me my first grade class, which was bare, emptied. The teacher, in re as, as the enemy in retreat, cleared the place, and there was no aspect on a billboard or anywhere, on a board or um, chalkboard that there had ever been a first grade class there. And that was the reception, bare, cold, unwelcoming. Henry prepared her classroom for the next day, the first day of class. That morning when I arrived, of course, the anger and the hostility was palpable. I was told that if I went downstairs, I would meet my student. So I walked from my first floor, first floor classroom down to a cavernous basement area of the school where one wall of that room, of the basement room, was a wall of doors onto which, uh, from which uh, there was a, a tarred playground. And the federal marshals apparently decided they would sneak Ruby in the back door and evade the mobs waiting for her at the front door and uh, where they could drive their limousine up to the door of those doors and scoot her in quickly. Those doors instantly opened and amidst this towering presence of federal marshals stood the most beautiful little girl one could ever dream of seeing, looking so delicate, so, so unaware of the mantle for change she wore that day. And as I went over toward her to introduce myself, she came forward and I think she felt she looked pretty, she was pretty special. And she was, and she looked that way. She beautiful pink dress, party dress, and everything matching. And really the only clue she wasn't going to a party was that she carried a lunchbox and a school bag. And as I walked over to meet her, her head, her bowed head sort of raised gently and a little smile came across her face. And then those beautiful big brown eyes that she still has rose to meet mine. And you know, it was a case of love at first sight. How could you not fall in love with a child like that in a moment like that? And so leaving behind a cameo of the past, Ruby and I it held our hands, left them, walked together upstairs to our first grade classroom in an empty corridor, empty school and began our solitary adventure. I was the art teacher, the music teacher, the gym teacher, the, the total math reading, phonics teacher. Phonics was a big part of my focus in teaching reading in the first grade. So I was, uh, I was everything to Ruby all day long from the beginning of school. And really, the only one we ever saw all day was the federal marshal who sat at our doorway keeping watch. So he became our classmate, in effect. And, uh, but no teacher, among the many who chose to remain in that school and had nothing to do, ever once offered to come and read a story or do music or anything that they perhaps could do far better than I, and come and share any aspect of our singular mission with us. It never got easier, except that it got more comfortable, I would say. It never got easier, but it was a situation to which I had adjusted. And just being with Ruby was a joy, and so every day was lovely. And I look forward every day to coming back and spending my day with my child. One day, when I was asked to go to that basement area, which I never did, to get, I don't know what the issue was, paper or something, I heard off to a side, coming from a room, music. And I thought, oh, I wonder what's going on there. So I went toward that room, and lo and behold, I discovered three or four children. And the teacher had the radio playing. I'd never been in his classroom where the teacher had the radio playing for music in those days. My days, classes were silent except for the teacher and the students' voices. So I was stunned, and I went up to the principal, and I said, why are they not with Ruby? And she said, well, that teacher won't teach her. And I said, well, I will go to the superintendent and tell him what's going on. I will 
but I'm sure he probably already knew, which I was totally so naive, I never thought of that at the time. And I said, well, I will teach them. And so shortly thereafter, they would come and join us for the afternoon. And I do remember that beginning where those three or four little kids just gingerly walked into that room because that was the first time they had ever been in a classroom with a black child. But you know, I mean, kids are kids, hearts free of prejudice. They just had, within a day or two, we were all comfortable together, having a grand time, doing little aspects of early social studies and things that we could share verbally together. And um, it was a very productive time, I thought. And it just showed how easy it was without prejudiced parents, leaving kids alone to make the decision about what is right, what felt right in their hearts. And they knew there was no problem. She was no different from them, except that she looked different. School continued like that day after day until Henry announced she wouldn't be returning the next year. The young teacher was expecting her first child, and at that time, pregnant teachers were not in the classroom. The Henry family moved to Boston to be closer to her family. Life moved on, and eventually Henry resumed teaching in Boston. She would tell her students about Ruby, and often thought about trying to find her. The phone rang, and I picked it up, and on the other side was this soft, satiny, melodious voice, and it said, Hello, Miss Henry. And I knew there was only one person in my life that would have a, a voice like that. And I said, Ruby, Ruby now, I can't believe this. This is a dream come true. And she said, well, I was hoping to go on the Oprah show to find you. Maybe we could go there together. And I thought, you know, my idea, my optimism having been somewhat dimmed over the years, I said, oh, that would be lovely, not thinking that reality would occur. And she said, maybe we, you know, we could meet together there. And I thought that would be wonderful. The meeting was booked. Henry traveled to Chicago and nervously waited for Oprah to call her onto stage, wondering if she would be able to recognize the little girl who 36 years earlier braved the shouting and spitting protesters. So when I walked up the stairs, there she stood, gorgeous, stunning, tall, black woman, no longer the little girl in the cute little party dresses, there was this stunning tall woman with, I remember, a blazing red jacket and very short black leather skirt looking positively smashing. And But what, what hadn't changed was that lovely smile and those gorgeous brown eyes. It was just as if time had evaporated in a way between us. And there we joined hands, sat down together just like we did uh, so many years before in our little classroom in New Orleans. After telling their story to Oprah, the two went around the country talking to students and convincing them that anyone, regardless of age, can do something courageous, worthwhile, noble, and good. One cannot underestimate the courage of Ruby and the power a child has. I ultimately came to rather quickly feel so glad that I was there um, at a moment when my presence made a difference. I think. Wonderful things happened in a little secluded classroom that today reverberates nationwide, which is really wonderful.